Hello, everyone. Let's get started. Um, I'm Manju George. Uh, I'm the scientific director at Pilot Town Development Foundation. Welcome to Doc Talks. Uh, today, we have with us uh, Dr. Rodrigo Perez, um, all the way from Brazil. And he's going to talk to us about watch and wait, uh, the risk of local regrowths. Um, so before we start, um, I want to ask Dr. Perez um, how he got involved in doing this, the kind of work that he's doing. So could you tell us a little bit about how you got into this? Of, of course, mind you, thank you very much uh, for having me. It's, it's really a pleasure and an honor. Um, so basically, I work with, with, the, with the surgeon who actually uh, had the initial idea that perhaps a few patients with rectal cancer did not require an operation. And, and, and she, uh, who is Dr. Angelita, I'll show you her picture in a minute. Uh, she really, you know, had the vision that this may be patients who had a complete clinical response after chemo radiation therapy. Maybe they did not require uh, a surgery. And in the beginning, it was quite, you know, controversial. People were nervous about the idea of not operating on rectal cancer. And now after maybe uh, nearly 30 years, uh, uh, it's become, you know, a lot of people accepted it and, and this is being done uh, worldwide. So, and, and now basically we, we kept on looking at the data constantly to make sure we were not doing any harm to our patients. And what I'll, I'll share with you today is just, just a little piece of the work that shows that, well, you know, even though this looks perfect, there are some problems and you really have to be careful about it and simply knowing what the problem is and inform people that, you know, maybe you have a perfect outcome, but there is a chance that problems may come down the line. So this is just a word of caution that like anything else in, in medicine, there's, there's always a price to pay for everything we do, right? Okay, sounds good. Then let's get started. Okay. So um, basically what, what, what I will show you is, you know, these are my disclosures, by the way. I work for Johnson & Johnson and Medtronic, uh, basically in educational talks. So basically rectal cancer used to be a surgical disease, meaning that if you had rectal cancer, you required radical surgery. And this is basically the specimen that we come out with. And, you know, I'm a surgeon and, and I, I like to do this operation, but the problem is that this operation, you know, no matter how good the surgeon is and how good the surgery was, the, this operation has significant consequences to our patients. You know, patients you know, they get really sick after this operation. And actually, some of these patients actually die after this operation because it, it has many uh, uh, related complications. And if, even if you, you know, you do well after surgery, there are several problems that you have to face down the line, including urinary dysfunction, sexual problems, fecal incontinence, even when you don't have to cope with a definitive stoma that for many people is, you know, quite a significant limitation of, of, of rectal cancer management. So uh, these are problems that we often have to face when we do surgery for rectal cancer. And, and this is why this particular surgeon, who is Professor Angelita, we, we used to call her the queen of coloproctology. She was really the one who, you know, had the idea that perhaps patients who had a complete response uh, to chemo radiation therapy, perhaps these patients would not require rectal uh, surgery and, and avoid them uh, and potentially uh, uh, protect them from the morbidity, from the mortality, and from the, all the consequences that I've listed to you uh, uh, in, in this slide. So basically, some of the patients who actually had, you know, these nasty cancers, they underwent chemo radiation therapy, and uh, it seems like magic, but really, some of these patients, when they do chemo radiation therapy, even though you don't really expect this to happen, and this is an actual patient of mine, the, the tumor is gone. The complete clinical response after chemo radiation therapy, and, and these patients, sometimes uh, we cannot see any cancer at all after the patient has undergone chemo radiation therapy. So it, it is true, and it happens to a quite significant number of patients, depending on baseline stage, 
And depending on the actual chemo radiation regimen, this is something that may happen to a quite significant proportion of these patients. Now, uh, as this became uh, very popular, uh, it, it is my task today to, to show you what the problems may be. So the, the first message I'd like to make sure that everybody gets is the fact that we would only offer this kind of treatment without surgery if the tumor is really low. It, I mean, you need to have a rectal cancer that needs to be below this dotted red line there. And I use the, the magnetic resonance imaging to point out that the cancers need to be very distal, very close to the anus. Why? Well, because if you have a cancer that is above this line, you're probably best suited with, it, with surgery. The complications are less, the, the dysfunctions are less uh, uh, catastrophic, and, and the mortality is not that significant. But when the tumor is located below this dotted line, then is that that's when the problems begin in terms of the functional outcomes, in terms of morbidity, in terms of uh, definitive stomas. But also, when the tumor is located below this line, it means that we have an additional tool to assess tumor response, which is our finger. So when we as doctors examine these patients, we are actually using a very important uh, tool in assessing tumor response. Because if your tumor is located above this line, it is very likely that the finger will not reach the area of the initial cancer, and which means we are uh, uh, less, uh, we are, uh, you know, we cannot assess the tumor with the finger, which is an important tool, as I will show you in a bit. Now, so when we do chemo radiation therapy, basically what we want to see is something like this. So we want to see a, a complete response with, with our finger. We want to see this white little scar, as you see there. There is no ulceration. The tumor is completely gone. Now I'll show you some examples. This is a cancer on the left hand side prior to chemo radiation therapy, and then when you look at after chemo radiation therapy, it's completely gone. This is the perfect scar we want to see, and and the, these are the patients that we are actually considering for a watch and wait, which means that we're not going to operate these patients. We're going to be following them up with all these uh, you know, studies, the finger, the endoscopy, as I just showed you. And finally, MR is, has become an integral part of, of this assessment, assessment uh, 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 criteria. So we usually use the finger, we use the uh, endoscopy, and finally, uh, the MR, which, which shows you basically there's nothing uh, around the rectum, which is the mesorectum, uh, so that we don't see any lymph nodes, we don't see any uh, affected vessels there. Uh, and then now the, the radiologists have become so proficient in looking into this. We want to see this really low signal black scar in the rectum, uh, uh, suggesting that there is a complete response, uh, both clinically, endoscopically, and uh, radiologically. So that's what we want to see. Uh, to really consider a, a, a patient candidate for a watch and wait strategy. Now, I have an important message for you all regarding the, the role of biopsies. A lot of people have, been, have now dis, are disregarding the endoscopic biopsies. And I want to clear this information for everyone. So a biopsy is not a, a, a criteria for watching weight. It means that if you have a negative biopsy, it doesn't mean you have a complete response. It only means you have a negative biopsy. So you have to be careful because we, if you fulfill the three criteria I just told you about, endoscopy, radiology, and clinical assessment, you really don't need a negative biopsy. Now, people often mistake because they have a negative biopsy, they start saying they have a complete clinical response. It has nothing to do with it. If you have a negative biopsy, all you have is a negative biopsy. Now, be careful, because if you don't fulfill the three criteria I just mentioned, then the negative biopsy may actually be misleading. 
It means that if you have a negative biopsy, but you don't fulfill the three criteria, you actually be, may be looking at residual cancer, but simply the biopsies weren't able to detect the residual cancer. So be careful with a negative biopsy because often people think that a negative biopsy is, you know, a, a, a go ahead signal for watch and wait, and it is absolutely not. Be careful with negative biopsies because they actually may be misleading in, in this scenario. So really have to think about the three criteria I just mentioned, which are endoscopy, radiology, and, 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 and clinical assessment uh, as, as the most relevant uh, features. Now, another question is, uh, 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 what, what, sh what chemo radiation do I have to to, to go or undergo to really think about organ preservation. And we have some interesting data to suggest that whenever you achieve something like this, like a perfect, complete clinical response with all three criteria, it doesn't really matter what kind of treatment you have undergone. So if you've done short course radiation, long course radiation, consolidation, induction chemotherapy, it really doesn't matter. Once you've achieved this, you're good to go for a watch and wait. So it doesn't really matter exactly what kind of, of, of treatment you have undergone. And this is what the conditional survival uh, data shows. It shows that regardless of the actual treatment uh, that you've received, and, and then a, a, second, a second variable becomes into play achieving a complete clinical response. But even more important is sustaining a complete clinical response. So the longer you sustain a complete clinical response, more likely you are to, to never require an operation at all. So it really uh, it counts in, in your favor as, as, as long as you sustain a complete clinical response. And then it doesn't matter what baseline stage you had and what kind of treatment you had, the fact that you achieved and sustain the complete response are the two most relevant factors in, in, a success, in a successful watch and wait program. Now, what's the problem? The problem is when you have something like this, you've achieved a complete clinical response and then you have not anymore. What does this mean? It means that the cancer has regrown. What we usually call these regrowths, and the definition is quite you know, it, it, tricky here, and, and what, everybody has to be careful about this. This is not a new cancer. It's the same cancer. It simply is grown back again. A lot of people think it, as it, this is a new cancer. It's not a new cancer. It's the same cancer. So if, if this is the same cancer, it means what we thought was a complete response wasn't. It means it really, you had an incomplete response, it apparently looked like a complete one, but it was never a complete. It was an incomplete response that we have mistaken for a complete clinical response. Now, the second important concept here is once you have something like this, an incomplete response or a regrowth, which are basically the same thing, you're actually looking at a cancer now that may be worse than it was in the beginning. Now, this is quite tricky again. And why is that so? Now, this is the concept that when you treat a cancer like this with chemo radiation, you end up killing the good cells and you're left with the bad cells. And once the cancer is growing back again, it means you're looking now at the very resistant cancer cells. And now this cancer may actually be worse than the one you had in the beginning because the proportion of resistant cancer cells is bigger. So these two concepts are really important that we're looking at. Number one, regrowths are really incomplete responses that look like a complete response. That's number one. And number two, the cancer now may be worse than it was in the beginning. Now, how often does this happen? Well, apparently one fourth of each pay, of all patients who achieve a complete clinical response will develop a local regret. So one out of four patients 
will have a local regrowth over time. That's number one. Number two, when it happens, it usually happens within the first three years of follow-up. You can see the plateau in this curve here. When you reach three years, the risk of local regrowth becomes minimal. So the three-year period, we as surgeons here, we have become obsessive in surveilling these patients to make sure that we don't have a local regrowth. And I'll show you in a minute why we are so obsessive. Now, surveillance needs to be done and we have some good news. The first good news is whenever you have a local regrowth, the vast majority of local regrowths, there is a endoluminal component. There is a rectal wall component of the local regrowth in 95% of these regrowths. Now, this is very important because it means that the finger and the eye will be able to detect 95% of them. You don't really need, you know, fancy studies. As long as you do proper surveillance, you will be able to detect 95% of them. And that's why clinical assessment is so important. Now, I always show this picture because this video is a patient of mine. If you look at it, it looks like a perfect, complete response. But the clinical examination was somewhat suspicious that I thought there was something there. So endoscopy may sometimes be almost perfect, but the finger is really important. And some of the local recurrences can only be detected by the finger. You can actually feel irregularities. And this is a patient of mine that actually had a local regrowth and the only study that could actually detect it was the finger. No MR, no PET-CT, no endoscopy, only the finger was able to detect it. So it, it shows how important clinical assessment and clinical examination is. Now, the second part of the surveillance has to do with endoscopy. Now, this used to be uh, what we did, normal endoscopy. And this is also an actual patient of mine. Now, this, if you, if you look this with, with the endoscopy, it looks like a perfect, complete response. But when we do NBI imaging, which is narrow band imaging, we change the colors of the light. And you can see how things start to appear once you use this advanced endoscopy. When we use this kind of light, look at the difference again. When we use NBI, and this is the same patient, we start seeing some whitish areas here. This is, this is a local regrowth that is detected very early on thanks to the NBI imaging. And, and there's another example here. If you see the normal light on your left, it looks a perfect, complete response. And when we do this same patient with the NBI, you can clearly see there's something wrong with the endoscopy there. And, and you start looking around and you can see there's an area, and this is a local regrowth that was early detected thanks to the NBI imaging. Now the finger is not able to detect this, but NBI can detect it. So we've implemented NBI as a routine endoscopic imaging for these patients. Now, third is obviously radiology. Now, you've noticed in the beginning, I, I mentioned that 95% of the rectal regrowths have some kind of endoluminal component, suggesting that the finger and the endoscopy are able to detect it. But sometimes, the only study that will detect the, M, the, the rope regrowth may be actually the, 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 the magnetic resonance. Radiology is important because it may detect uh, sometimes a local regrowth, not only in the rectal wall as, the, as this case here, you can see it looks like a complete response, but the MR shows a progressive thickening of the rectal wall, somewhat suggesting there's something wrong, or something like this. You can see there's a complete response within the rectal wall, but radiology was able to detect a node in the follow-up. This is the first MR. We can see the node shows up in the subsequent uh, MR imaging. So yes, 
MR has become an integral part of the not only the assessment of tumor response, but only but also surveillance of these patients, as sometimes these local regrowths may happen away from the primary tumor in mesorectal nodes. So you have to be careful with those uh, um, as well. So this is why we are so obsessive uh, in the follow-up of these patients. So during those three years that I mentioned, we see these patients at the most two to three months. Every two to three months, these patients come back for digital rectal examination, endoscopy with, with NBI imaging and uh, for MR imaging. So magnetic resonance has become a part of the follow-up of these patients, particularly during those three years, which are the high-risk period for development of, of local regrowths. What do we know about risk factor for local regrowths? Well, apparently the only factor that we know that seems to be a risk factor for local regrowth is baseline T stage. So it's it's very intuitive. So the, 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 the more aggressive the tumor is in the beginning, the higher the risk for subsequent local regrowth. And it's very easy to, to remember. A T2 cancer has a 20% risk. A T3 cancer has a 30% risk. And a T4 cancer has a 40% risk. So it means that you have to be careful. You know, the, the more advanced the cancer is, more careful you need to be in terms of, of surveillance because there is sub subsequent risk of local regrowth, uh, the, the more aggressive the cancer is in the beginning. Now, during the 30 year, uh, you know, experience with watch and wait, we were always, you know, uh, very careful because people were concerned when the local regrowth happened, we were not going to be able to salvage these patients. You know, patients thought, and a lot of surgeons thought that when you had a local regrowth, it was going to be unresectable disease. And this is not true whatsoever. Apparently, the vast majority of local regrowths, yes, are amenable to salvage resection. That seems not to be a problem. As a matter of fact, once you have a local regrowth, it appears we can do the same operation the patient was a candidate in the beginning. It means the patient was a candidate for an APR, for an abdominal perineal resection, if she or he has a local regrowth, he's probably going to receive the same operation he was in the beginning. We usually don't change from one operation because of the local regrowth. But there is an exception to this, which is in favor to our patients. Some of the local regrowths have been detected so early on, we were able to salvage them with the local excision because it was so tiny, so very small and so superficial that we were able to resect them locally without having to do total mesorectal excision. And by doing this, providing them with an opportunity of another type of organ preservation, which is local excision, which clearly doesn't have the same problems of total mesorectal excision. So provided you do proper surveillance, and you detect these early regrowths very early on in a very small uh, uh, area, you are actually able to do a local excision. In our experience, these patients were more likely to be early cancers in the beginning. So they were really more frequently T2s in the beginning. Those were the patients that at the time of regrowth were more likely to be successfully salvaged by a local excision instead of a TME. And if you look at the outcomes of patients managed by a local excision, they actually did as good or as, or even better than the patients that we needed to salvage with a radical procedure. So local excision here doesn't seem to compromise survival to these patients. And at the end of the day, it means that what we were concerned about, which is really uh, 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 resectability of these cancers at the time of local regrowth, it's, it seems not to be a problem. But as there always is an Achilles heel of anything that we do, there's an, an Achilles heel of, of watch and wait. And this has to do with systemic recurrences. It has to do with distant metastasis.
Um, and why is that a problem? Well, because when you look at the patients who underwent watch and wait and the risk of distant metastasis, you look into these tables and you figure it out very easily. Patients who have successful watch and wait, no local regrowth, the risk of distant metastasis is really low. Whereas patients who have undergone watch and wait and then have a local regrowth and then are salvaged, successfully salvaged, they still have a very quite significant risk for subsequent distant metastasis. And the differences here are quite striking. And this is the first study that really pointed out this. And the problem with this study is they were looking into very small numbers of patients. And then we looked into the international watch and wait database, looking at multiple values. And you can see variables. And you can see the number of patients here. We're almost looking at 800 patients with a complete clinical response managed by watch and wait. The only significant feature associated with a high risk of distant metastasis was not initial stage, was not the kind of treatment. The only feature was the fact that the patient had a local regrowth or not. Patients who have a local regrowth have a higher subsequent risk of developing distant metastasis. Now, when we have a patient with rectal cancer, regardless of the treatment, when these patients complete five years of treatment and there's no metastatic disease, we use to congratulate them. We say then, congratulations, you've completed five years. There's almost zero risk for subsequent distant metastasis. Now, when you think about it, if a patient has a local regrowth, then the story is slightly different. The patient has a rectal cancer, and one year after, he or she develops a local regrowth. After this, the patient only has minimal risk of having distant metastasis when he or she completes five years, not from the initial cancer, but five years from the local regrowth. It's somewhat like the, the clock needs to be restarted at the time of the local regrowth as if we're looking at a second cancer. So you have to be careful because when you have a local regrowth, the five years need to be counted, not from the baseline cancer, but from the time you've developed a local regrowth. Now, if you think about it, this comparison is probably unfair. Because as I mentioned in the beginning, local regrowths are really incomplete responses. And we're comparing them to complete responses. So no wonder, Rodrigo, there are differences between complete and incomplete responses in many ways. And of course, with the risk of distant metastasis. So perhaps in, we had to compare the local regrowths with a proper comparator of incomplete responses instead of comparing them to complete responses, because then we will be comparing apples to oranges. So when we compare incomplete responses to local regrowths, apparently there are no differences. The comparison of patients with local regrowth and those operated on for incomplete pathological response seems to be no differences in terms of survival. This is a retrospective study done long ago by our own group, showing that patients were suspected for a complete clinical response, but ended on to have a local regrowth, salvaged. The risk of distant metastasis was no different from patients with incomplete response right off the bat, managed by TME, managed by radical surgery. So no difference. And as a matter of fact, a recent randomized clinical trial showed the same outcome. This is the OPRA trial recently published. And you can see patients in the red line, the ones who had a local regrowth and needed to be salvaged, did 
similar to patients managed by TME by surgery at the time of restaging without a local regrowth. Suggesting that, you know, a local regrowth is the same as an incomplete response. So it doesn't really matter if you operate them early on or at the time of the local regrowth. But I think that comparison is not fair as well. Because when you look, if you, if you look at it, patients with local regrowth, yes, they are incomplete responses. I agree with that. But they actually had almost perfect response in the beginning. And patients who underwent TME had never a perfect response. And that's the reason they underwent TME. So that's not a fair comparison. We need to compare patients who undergo radical surgery, but had excellent response, similar to the ones who were managed by watch and wait. And when we do so, then there seems to be a difference. And this is a study we did comparing patients with local regrowth to the ones who underwent radical surgery, but had also excellent response. And when we balance these groups by excellent response, we start to see differences in the risk of subsequent metastasis. Patients who undergo TME up front have less distant metastasis than patients who have initial complete response, local regrowth, salvage of the local regrowth, and then a higher risk of distant metastasis. And when you break out into the actual pathological stages, you can see that patients with more advanced disease at the time of local regrowth, these patients do, do even worse. So if you detect a patient with a local regrowth early on, superficial disease, small, they do as well as those who undergo radical surgery up front. But the ones that you fail to detect properly, when they have significant disease at the time of salvage, these patients are actually doing worse in terms of subsequent risk for distant metastasis well, once they had a complete response. So at the end of the day, when you balance for response, these patients seem to do somewhat worse in terms of the risk of distant metastasis. So it's, it's difficult to interpret this data because uh, we are talking about a very small number of patients. Because if you remember when I mentioned, you know, only a fourth of patients would actually have a local regrowth. And then 25% of the 25% will develop subsequent metastasis. We're really talking small number of patients here, but when you look at a big number of patients with local regrowth, you start seeing this, you know, subtle differences in terms of the, the risk of distant metastasis. And this is something we should be really careful about. So in summary, when you think about it, a local regrowth so far seems to be the only risk factor for subsequent distant metastasis development once you've undergone a watch and wait strategy, once you've achieved a complete response. Now, if you have a local regrowth, you need to be starting the risk of distant metastasis at the time of local regrowth and not at the time of the primary cancer. Sometimes these regrowths may happen as long as three years from the baseline cancer, which means you need to complete now eight years from the primary cancer and not only five. Be careful because the local regrowths, they seem to have the similar outcomes to incomplete responses managed by TME. But again, these groups are not balanced for the response, the initial response. And remember, patients who have a local regrowth, they, by definition, had so good response, we actually mistaken them for a complete clinical response and not operated them. So when we balance these patients by excellent response, we really start to see uh, seeing some differences 
in terms of the risk of subsequent distal metastasis, particularly if these patients have, at the time of salvage, advanced disease for their local regrowth. So these, we believe, are important messages that people thinking about organ preservation these days need to be considering uh, when embarking on this treatment strategy. And I'm not by any chance start, you know, I'm not saying we shouldn't be doing watch and wait. We, this is definitely something that we need to consider, but we need to look at these numbers carefully when we think about uh, a watch and wait. And number two, we have to absolutely be obsessive about local regrowths because we really need to detect them early on uh, or, and at the you know very slight possibility or, or suspicion of a local regrowth means that we need to be probably salvage these, salvaging these patients with, with some kind of, 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 of surgery. Um, so thank you very much, Manju. I, I'm sure there, there are people who want to ask questions and, and yourself, and I'll be happy to ask, answer any questions from you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Paris. Um, I think there are a couple of questions. Um, we can look at those first. Sure. So um, there are two questions. So one is that when under watch and wait protocol, uh, when there are when two lymph nodes shrink from five millimeters and four millimeters to three millimeters and two millimeters at six weeks after, would that constitute complete response? So, yeah, I think it's a very important question, uh, Matthew. I think that, um, you know, we used to be, radiologists are usually, you know, the overcall lymph nodes. So we, we are very careful in over, not overcalling lymph nodes positive simply because we are seeing them. Uh, we really need to look at the, you know, all the criteria for really calling a positive lymph node a positive lymph node. So size is not is clearly not the, the 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 sole criteria for calling a lymph node positive. That's number one. We need to be looking at border regularity, signal intensity. All these features need to be considered. Now, number two, uh, when we see a complete response within the rectal wall, that's usually a very good surrogate marker for a response uh, within the mesorectum as well. So it's, it's not a rule, but usually when you see a complete primary tumor response, usually the mesorectal component of the disease has a, a, a similar response to the primary. So whenever we see a complete response in the primary and, and we see very, very tiny little uh, areas of lymph nodes, uh, we, we, we can definitely watch and wait them. Now, we don't ignore them, we, we, we look for them in the subsequent surveillance uh, studies, and, and definitely we should be careful about them. I hope this answers the, the, the questions, Manju. Mm -hmm. I think then he's asking, um, if having a local excision first followed by chemo radiation, um, is watch and wait still a good path? Yeah, I think, you know, there's... This is also a, an alternative treatment to, uh, in rectal cancer that is also considered to be organ preservation. Uh, we usually uh, we usually think uh, that this is very you know acceptable alternative, particularly uh, if the, the patient was if the if the cancer was initially staged as a T two and not disease as as it was stated. We have good data from prospective trials that T2s and zeros managed by chemo radiation uh, therapy followed by local excision is a good alternative. Now, when you, when you turn things around, when you do first local excision and then chemo radiation, uh, we were not sure uh, that the, the, the outcomes are the same, but once one would you know, consider that the, the outcomes are, are pretty similar, but we, we don't have as good evidence as we have for the new adjuvant approach of chemo radiation therapy first. Now, the advantages of doing local excision first is that we are actually looking at the cancer and, and making sure it's a T2 and zero, or at least T2, because we're never sure that the N0 component wants to be done a local excision, but it has the advantage of, of properly staging the T component of the disease. And, and there is some data to suggest that this is is, is pretty good in terms of, 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 of you know, 
local excision alone, followed by chemo radiation therapy as a good alternative to, uh, for, for organ preservation strategy. Okay, thank you. So the other question is that um, if there is metastatic spread after watch and wait, you know, like what you were talking about is you have a local regrowth and then uh, you've seen that with the local regrowth, there is a high chance of distant metastasis. In that case, what is the average overall survival? Is it much different from, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's a very good question. I mean, I think that the, um, we, you know, the problem with watch and wait is watch and wait is be, has begun in, in 1991. So we were really 30 years old of, of watch and wait. So we really don't know what the overall survival of patients with metastatic disease uh, is after we have a local regrowth. We've been able to you know, catch the differences uh, for the appearance of distant metastasis. And we're now looking what happens to these patients once they have metastasis. One would think that there would be no differences in terms of the outcomes of these patients once they have distant metastasis as any other patient with distant metastasis. But the truth is, we still don't know what the outcomes of the distant metastasis is, is once we've done watch and wait. We really don't know whether these cancers are any worse or any better than patients treated by the standard uh, regimen. So that's a very good question. And this is something we are uh, definitely uh, looking into exploring into the data. And one of the limitations is that, you know, as I said in the beginning, watch and wait is a very, you know, very new, young uh, treatment uh, alternative. So we really don't have, you know, a, a, a sufficient amount of data in terms of long-term data to really make sure that the, that the overall survival is not any better or any worse than the usual patient with metastatic disease. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is, what are your thoughts on going on watch and wait after having an excision of the small remaining tumor post-chemo radiation? So this patient was originally T2N0, but um, she had refused APR and then the surgeon did a TAE. Then she was downstaged to stage zero as no cancer was found in what he excised. So that's that's really that's really uh, uh, you know that's really good uh, and and I'm I'm very you know that's something that we would like to see uh, twenty patient I think Rita that's almost perfect because once you did chemo radiation therapy uh, number one this the, the original stage of the cancer wasn't an advanced one. And then you confirm by local excision that, the, that there is a complete pathological response. I think you're you know, very likely to not have a, a local recurrence or a systemic relapse uh, whatsoever. This is the patient or this is the, you know, the situation that is probably one of the best uh, in terms of the outcomes. So that's clearly the case that we would recommend watch and wait. As a matter of fact, in the beginning, we were worried in a number of patients that there was really a complete clinical response or there was a question whether there was a complete clinical response. So we did a lot of local excisions among these patients, many of which had a complete pathological response as, as you stated. And those patients are the ones who, who, who do the best. So I think that you're you know very promising that this is never going to recur. Uh, both locally and and systemically, uh, but again, you you need to be you know properly surveilled and 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 followed uh, at least five years from the primary cancer and, and being careful. Now the problem is with the local excision is when once you do a local excision, uh, there is scarring of the rectum and distortion of the rectum, so sometimes it's challenging to surveil these patients as opposed to patients who watch and wait where we never did any kind of local excision because the rectum is uh, you know, perfect in a way that we didn't do any resection. So there's really no scarring effect, uh, both for endoscopy, clinical assessment, and finally also for, for radiology. So that's one of the things that you have to be careful about when you do a local excision. But definitely that would be the situation that is most promising in terms of, of a good outcome. So I'm going to skip that question about the overall survival and then go to what Matthew asked. 
I understand watch and wait considering the scar appearance. Um, would it make sense if a full thickness or ESC procedure was done to pathologically verify the complete response? Yeah, so Matthew, that's a very good question. It makes sense, but you have to consider the following. A local excision in the setting of chemo radiation therapy may be somewhat painful because scarring and healing of, you know, of the defect that we create by doing a local excision, suturing it off, sometimes breaks down because of radiation therapy. And sometimes these, you know, wound dehiscences may be quite painful. Um, if you think about it, if you've done a local excision and there is no cancer, uh, you really didn't add much by doing a local excision. You simply made sure uh, and confirmed what you suspected in the beginning anyways. And then you have to deal with the pain and sometimes with uh, with slight functional consequences of the, of the local excision itself. Some, you know, very few patients actually have significant complications after local excision, but I've seen patients who actually require the stoma simply because of complications following a local excision. So, you know, it may be a very good out, uh, alternative, but it's clearly not, you know, uh, the perfect alternative for everyone. We still think that if you have a perfect, complete response, you're better off with a close surveillance than a local excision simply to confirm that this is a complete response. Now, a minor comment in terms of ESD. I don't think ESD is a good procedure for this. Now, ESD, the, for those of you who don't know what ESD means, it means endoscopic submucosal dissection. When you have a rectal cancer, if you do ESD, it means you are removing only the superficial la layers of the rectum. It doesn't make you absolutely certain that there is no residual cancer in the muscularis proper layer, which is never resected by ESD. So you have to be careful with ESD. Number two, ESD may be somewhat challenging because of the scarring of the radiation therapy itself. Sometimes it's very difficult to perform ESDs among these patients. So uh, we really don't know yet what's the role of ESD. There is a subset of patients who develop residual adenomas in the vicinity of the scars that may be resected by ESDs. So apart from those very particular patients, I believe ESD is not the best alternative here. Thank you. So um, we'll go to the next question and then we'll come back to the survival one. So this question is about uh, recurrence in the mesorectal fascia outside the rectum. And if this is not compromising the rectum itself and there is no other systemic sign of disease, um, is there a consensus on using sphincter sparing surgery depending on where the lesion is? Or you know, could radiation achieve total response and spare the patient um, low anterior resection? Um, so that's more of a challenging question. So when we think about disease outside of the mesorectal fascia, basically we should be talking about the lateral pelvic uh, compartments. Um, if we see lateral pelvic compartment disease and it looks radiologically like a lymph node, those are the patients that we would go on and do uh, a lateral pelvic compartment surgery. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean we need to do an LAR. Or so, or in other words, it doesn't necessarily mean we need to do radical rectal surgery, but the lateral compartments need to be, uh, in, uh, you know, somewhat uh, uh, approached. Now, we are careful when we see something outside of the mesorectal fascia that it doesn't look like a node, then the outcomes may be quite uh, disappointing. When we see uh, vascular uh, disease outside of the, of the mesorectal compartment, when you start seeing lateral pelvic disease other than lymph nodes, then we are less um, uh, you know, keen on doing lateral pelvic surgery because we know that the outcomes are not as good. So uh, in terms of radiation therapy there, usually if this was part of the disease in the beginning, the lateral compartment is part of the radiation field or should have been part of the radiation therapy field. So it means that we're not being, we're not gonna be able to re-irradiate those areas anymore. Once you have disease after chemoradiation therapy, 
in the lateral compartments, it means you usually need to consider surgery because there is no other form of giving additional therapy because it has been included in the original uh, radiation therapy field. I hope this answers the question. Yeah. So if the patient did not have, like, for example, if it was, if the patient was originally stage four, and they didn't get chemo radiation, then the lateral uh, pelvic lymph nodes would be able to be irradiated, right? Yes, yeah. So, yeah. so if you if you have if you have disease outside of the mesorectal fascia and the pelvic the pelvis has never been irradiated, then there is an opportunity to use radiation therapy for local control. Uh, but if the if the pelvis has been irradiated in the you know in the past. It's very unlikely they were going to be able to 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 attack these uh, uh, this disease uh, with 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 radiation therapy alone. Okay, thank you. I think there's another question about um, about the high risk features like um, lymphovascular invasion, PNI, etc. With non-operative watch and wait, do these pathological features um, no longer matter? Um, well, okay, so I'll, I'll address these both questions, both of the uh, high risk features and also the CT DNA. Uh, so number one, so once you have lymphovascular invasion, perineural invasion, uh, you can only assess those invasions pathologically. There's no other way to see vascular invasion unless you have extramural vascular invasion, which is, you know, a, a, a big vessel invaded. Microscopic disease can only be detected microscopically. So if you've done chemo radiation and the primary tum tumor is gone endoscopically, radiologically, and clinically, the vast majority of these patients will not have disease mi microscopically. Uh, do we disregard them? No, we're not disregarding them. We're simply uh, 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 suggesting that the only way of confirming residual disease would be removing the rectum and we know that removal of the rectum has some significant consequences to our patients and taking into consideration there's a high chance there is no residual disease we're not going to be doing this simply to confirm the, its absence now are, are we disregarding them not not at all we are surveilling these patients because we truly believe there's a risk for microscopic residual disease. And that's the sole reason we are obsessive about the local regrowth. Now, you always have to balance the risk of having residual microscopic disease and needing radical surgery, which is which may, you know, uh, may, may be, a, you know, a, 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 an acceptable balance for some patients and an unacceptable balance for others. And this is something we, you have to discuss uh, ahead of time before you embark on a watch and wait program. Now, CT DNA. I've noticed there's two questions about CT DNA. CT DNA is very promising. However, so far, we don't really know how to interpret the outcomes of CT DNA. And I'll, I'll, I'll show an example. When you do chemo radiation therapy and the tumor is gone, if you do CT DNA, and the CT DNA is positive, what does it mean? Does it mean we have circulating distant metastasis or does it mean we still have residual cancer in the rectum? We don't really know. So when you have a positive test, what should we do? Should we remove the rectum or should we start chemotherapy? We don't know because there's a risk that we're treating microscopic metastatic disease and we don't need surgery, or we may be giving chemotherapy for microscopic resi residual disease, when really what we're seeing is micro, mi microscopic residual disease in the rectum. So we don't really know once we have a positive test. And the other way around happens as well. If we have a negative test, we have data to suggest that there are patients with residual disease so microscopic that the CD DNA is negative. So it's a false negative test. So because of that, we are not taking into consideration yet CT DNA as the sole driver of decision management among patients undergoing watch and wait. I, I totally agree. It's a very promising tool, 
we could certainly look at it. We are actually looking at it as we speak, but we don't really rely on CT DNA data yet to consider watch and when. Okay, so I have a I have a couple of questions. So initially, when you were talking about the risk of local regrowth, you were talking about how you know the T1, T2, T3, the risk of local regrowth increase as the T stage increases. So um. For patients who want to undergo watch and wait, like um, the staging of their tumor is very, very important, right? And then you're using like endoscopy, MRI, all of those to stage. And from what I have seen, there is a lot of variability between like uh, clinicians assessing what stage it is, right? Like, so what are, what can we do as patients to make sure that, you know, there is no difference or like, you know, when we are being counseled for a chance of watch and wait, how to make sure that like the staging thing and all of that is properly taken care of? That's a very good question, mind you. I think that, you know, when we, when we, whenever I give this, these talks, whenever I talk about watch and why, uh, well, you know, people ask me, should, should everyone be doing watch and why in the, in the world? I honestly don't think so. I, I honestly don't think that rectal cancer should be managed everywhere in the world. I honestly think that this has become so complex disease with so many little details that we need to be doing this in specialized centers that have people in radiology, radiation oncology, medical oncology, colorectal surgery that are focused in rectal cancer management. I often tell my patients, I almost only do rectal cancer surgery or rectal cancer. Uh, all of my, you know, practice is dedicated to that. And still, you know, I have some difficult cases and I have some problems. Now, if, if, if you're doing this in a center where, you know, people taking care of you are doing this once a month or once, you know, every two or three weeks, you probably should be seeing people that do this a lot. Uh, because, you know, you have to, uh, it takes hours of practice and hours of, you know, of doing this to really, uh, uh, you know, minimize the risks of, of, of miscalling uh, their disease. Now, I'm, I'm not really, uh, I'm not really concerned only about the T stage, but there's so many other features uh, that we have to look into. The, I, 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 you know, to make a long story short, uh, the the number of patients that come to me with an MR for rectal cancer that the MR needs to be repeated because of poor quality of the way it was taken is nearly 100%. I rarely see a patient with a you know MR being done for rectal cancer, and I live in a large city, you know, where you would expect that many centers would be dedicated for rectal cancer, and I still see a lot of, you know, non-proper MR, MRs, and, and, you know, it's it's a problem we have to deal with. So I think we really, when we're talking about rectal cancer and some of these, you know, very controversial organs uh, preserving strategies, these need to be done in very specialized cancer centers that really are uh, including people that are dedicated to rectal cancer management. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so the other question that I had is like about, you know, in say, for example, in Colin Town, one of the concerns that a lot of people have is that they're really worried that they do watch and wait. And then, like you said, you know, they have a local regrowth. They're worried that will that local regrowth be responsible for the distant metastasis? You know, there is, there is a concern. So my question would be that like, do we have any evidence to know that, um, the, the, the people that you see the local regrowths or like what you call the incomplete responses, which were misclassified as complete responses, are those diseases or are those tumors biologically different and have a higher chance of, you know, both local regrowth and distant metastasis, or is the local regrowth somehow resulting in an increased chance of distant metastasis? Do we know more about these questions? So that's a very good question. We are currently looking into this, Manju, mm -hmm. and it appears that there's something wrong with the local regrowths themselves. There's something 
you know, biologically intrinsic to those regrowths that make them particularly worse in terms of this metastasis. And we are not sure that doing surgery up front would, would actually change anything. But, you know, it's very difficult. And the, and the difficulty here is, the challenge here is, we cannot operate someone, you know, the same patient cannot be operated at two different times. He's either operated up front or he's operated at the time of local regrowth. So we don't know whether this would make a difference. We are doing the best that we can to look into this. And we have, you know, we're actually looking at this right now. It appears, because one of the things is, you know, it could be the time. The time that it took for us to detect a local regrowth is the responsible for the, you know, worse outcomes. And we are actually looking into this. And apparently it isn't the time. Because local regrowths that, you know, develop very early on, and those who develop two years after chemo radiation therapy, it doesn't make a difference. The time made no difference in the risk of subsequent metastasis. So there's there's more, there's something more about it that we still don't know. Apparently, there's something biologically intrinsic to the local regrowths that made them particularly prone to the risk of this one. Now, this doesn't mean we don't need to be obsessive about them. We are obsessive about them because we want to detect them very early on and we want to you know, be able to, to salvage them as early as we can. And there's another message behind the story. We've become you know, more strict, even more stringent in the terms of criteria. You know, if you have a near complete response, you shouldn't be doing watch and wait. You need to be a perfect complete response if you're thinking about watch and wait. You're not, should, you should not be doing watch and wait. If you have, you know, there's a small little ulcer. No, 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 no. We are not, you know, permissive. We're, we've become even more strict over the years because of the risk of a local break. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's one question that we should ask, uh, answer. Um, um, what is the usual time to survival for rectal cancer patients with distant metastatic disease? What are you seeing these days? So yeah, that's a very good, that is a very good point. Um, so, you know, over the years, colorectal cancer has become, uh, you know, is a, basically the pharma industry is very much interested in, in patients with colorectal cancer for obvious reasons, because of numbers and numbers means money for them. So it means that we have a lot of treatment alternatives for metastatic disease in patients with colorectal cancer. Now, if you have, used to be that metastatic disease had an average survival of one year, and now the average survival has gone up to three years, it means that we, we can treat these patients in many ways. And remember, a, you know, a proportion of patients with metastatic disease is still you know, uh, amenable to, to be cured. By, by, by resection of, of their metastatic disease. So 25% uh, of these patients are actually cured by, by, by radical surgery. So, you know, metastatic disease is by far the end of the line in, in, in rectal cancer. And the average survival is beyond three years currently with the amount of, of, of treatments that we have. There's so many details and complexities in metastatic disease. It depends on where it happens, when it happens, and, and how it happens, and the alternatives that we, we have available to us. And remember now, we you know, rectal cancer has become two different diseases, the ones with microsatellite instability and the, the ones with microsatellite stability are completely different diseases simply because we now have immunotherapy uh, available to us. So it's, you know, it's an ongoing target and, a, a, you know, a moving target. And, and, and the outcomes of metastatic disease has improved dramatically over the years. So we're really talking about, you know, almost like a chronic disease rather than, you know, a terminal disease, how it used to be called. Mm -hmm. I think, uh, Matthew, has, uh, we are past the time. I don't know if you have time to stay or. Yeah, I, I have a, a, a few minutes to, to ask the, the answer the few the last questions, if you like. Yeah. So uh, Matthew is asking about, uh, you know, is there any way to refine staging in rectal cancer? So there are 
they're looking at like weight of T stage and then influence of T two N one and you know what's what are your thoughts? Yeah, so re refinement of these of, of rectal cancer staging is definitely uh, you know a reality now. We are looking at so many different features in, that are not taken into consideration of the T stage uh, of the of rectal cancer stage. If you look at the NCCN guidelines, uh, you know they're very you know very simple. Uh, the it, and, it, and rectal cancer is not that simple anymore. And rectal cancer has so many different variables that need to be taken into consideration. So the mesorectal fascia, lateral nodes, uh, the, the height of the cancer, uh, in addition to EMVI and, and so on, tumor deposits. So yes, we definitely need to refine rectal cancer staging. But then the problem becomes who is going to be, you know, uh, av available or, you know, uh, um, uh, who is going to be staging those patients. I mean, we need to train so many radiologists across the world the world to, to be able to, to properly stage these patients. But I think it's, you know, there's no other way and there's no turning around. Rectal cancer needs to be dealt with in very specialized uh, cancer centers and staging needs to be refined. We, I cannot even discuss you know guidelines anymore because the guidelines are so you know you know gross in terms of separating patients that uh, you know are not compatible anymore so yes uh, refining rectal cancer staging has become a reality now and it really depends on where you go if you go to a very specialized rectal cancer uh, center they are going to talk to you about many other things that you know, in a more basic uh, institution, probably it, it will it will even not it will not even be considered because they're not looking at it uh, uh, properly. Yeah, I think the last question is about chemo. Um, so the use of KPOX four infusions or four cycles as adjuvant treatment um, after you know TAE with no evidence of disease. I, I love that question, Manju. You know, the, the reason I love that question, Brita, thank you, is, is the fact that the, I, I, I'm, I'm in a war against the, the medical oncologist. And, and the war is because I think the medical oncologists give too much chemotherapy to our patients with rectal cancer. We're actually running a trial in Brazil, a prospective randomized trial in Latin America, I'm sorry, and we're doing de-escalating the treatment of these patients. We're not, number one, we're doing only uh, uh, only four cycles of chemotherapy uh, instead of six cycles of chemotherapy. And we're comparing Capox to Capecitabine alone because we think oxaliplatin, particularly to the, two T, the T2s, they're not really, uh, there is no really benefit of, 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 of oxaliplatin in this, in this scenario. We honestly think that oxaliplatin only adds uh, toxicity without giving, without adding any benefit to our patients. So we're running a trial comparing Capox to Capecitabine alone because we think that the T2s only need Capecitabine, uh, both for achieving a complete clinical response and uh, for adjuvant purposes. So I, I don't believe KPOX is the answer uh, for, for all patients with T2 rectal cancer. I, I really love the question because this is the question that needs to be addressed. And that's the reason we're running a trial because if you look at the data, there is absolutely no data comparing KPOX to Capecitabine alone. And, and, and if our data and if our trial is negative, I suspect that you know medical oncologists will be convinced we do not need to give oxaliplatin to all of our patients with rectal cancer simply because you know we're we're doing uh, we're treating patients on the safe side because it really gives a lot of toxicity to our patients. Okay, okay, thank you very much. So basically, that is like stage two colon cancer, almost going that route. Absolutely, absolutely, yeah, yes. Yeah. And, and if you think about it. The IDEA trial shows that, you, you know, we need, yeah. we don't need to give so much chemotherapy in terms of time. And we are over treating a lot of our patients with, with chemotherapy. If you think about it, CT DNA will probably change management here because yeah. a lot of patients with stage two with CT DNA negative probably don't need chemotherapy at all. So yeah. it's, yeah. it's, I think chemotherapy 
uh, you know, medical oncologists give too much chemotherapy. And I, I, you know, I, every MDT session in my institution is a fight against the medical oncologists because they want to give a lot of chemotherapy to our patients. And, I, and it gives a lot of toxicity. And sometimes it's really just a lot of false hopes. Uh, and you have to deal with the, you know, it's, it's, it's a problem. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, this you. was very, very, very informative and useful. So um, the video of the recording we'll put on Colentown University in about two weeks. Okay. So, yeah. It was, I hope, it was uh, great uh, having you. Thank you, Manju. And we will be happy to come again whenever you need me. All right? Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Bye, everyone. everyone. Have a good weekend. Bye. You too. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Bye.